1974, he completed a Master of Arts in Church and Community at Skerritt College. In 1978, he finished a doctoral program in psychology at Peabody College of Vanderbilt University. In 1979, gee, this is getting worse, Daryl. In 1979, Daryl joined the Quaker Church, and later he attended the Presbyterian Church. From 1969 to 1984, he taught Sunday school, preached, and was a tenor soloist at several church choirs. He left the church in the mid-1980s. In May of 2011, Ray and Amanda Brown, an undergraduate at the University of Kansas studying sex and sexuality, released the results of a self-reporting online survey of over 14,500 American secularists. And this report was entitled, Sex and Secularism, the theme of our conference. What do you know? And it, it was called, Sex and Secularism, What Happens When You Leave Religion? Concluding that sex improves dramatically after leaving religion. <laughs> and people who are religious exhibit similar sexual behaviors as the non-religious, but the experience is markedly increased guilt if you're religious. So Daryl published, the, no, Daryl has recently published Sex and God, How Religion Distorts Sexuality Based on, on His Recent Research. So please help me welcome the first speaker of the morning and his presentation entitled Sex and Secularism, Dr. Daryl Ray. I want to bless this occasion this morning with a prayer. So would you all, how many of you are familiar with the Flying Spaghetti Monster? How many of you are Pastafarians yourselves? Uh, Pastafarians, you have to bow your head. The rest of you can do whatever you want. All right. Dear Flying Spaghetti Monster, we thank you for giving us sex and sexuality. Whether homo or heterosexual, bi or trans, and for not making us like those uptight Christians, Muslims, Mormons, and Baptists. We thank you for wonderful masturbatory fantasies and for the pornography upon which they're often based. FSM, we ask that you grant us sex partners, lovers, wives, and husbands that know where our G-spots, our clitoris, and the sweet spot on our penis is. Grant us long loving foreplay with deep wet kisses followed by huge orgasms and loving cuddles after. Grant us the courage and wisdom to communicate openly and honestly with our partners and give them more pleasure than we receive, for we know it is better to give than to receive. Your noodliness, we do not need 72 virgins. In fact, we ask that you send us no virgins, for we don't want to have to train them. <laughs> Unless, of course, they're very willing to be trained. We especially plead today that you not send any repressed Christian virgins, male or female, for they will only feel guilty and cause great problems with their abstinence-only training. You are posthumous. We ask that you give us the wisdom to understand and appreciate our partner's kinks or lack thereof, whether foot worship or spanking, ropes or talking dirty. Help us to appreciate their full sexuality and lead us not into temptation or judgment of scorn for others when their sexual preferences are not ours. We ask in the name of Raman for retribution, shame, and scorn on pedophile priests, hypocritical ministers sleeping with a choir director, and gay bashing closeted ministers, etc. O oh, SpaghettiO, we ask that you send condoms and birth control in abundance, and your blessings to the many dedicated workers at the Trojan Condom Factory and Planned Parenthood. In the name of Dan Savage and Greta Christina, we pray, for they are the true gods and goddesses of our world. Do I hear a ramen? Ramen. ramen. There you go. All right. Well, I am the, and that's with a capital T, high priest of the church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. There are no others. And if anybody tells you otherwise, they're lying. All right. So I began this whole process of, of doing research in sex and secularism as a process of doing research for my new book, Sex and God. 
And little did I know, I, was, I, I grabbed a tiger by the tail. We thought we were, Amanda and I thought we were going to do just a little bit of research to support a, a little bit of what we wanted to say in the book. Well, it turned out the research took on a life of its own. What we're going to talk about here today is chapter 16 of Sex and God. It's only one chapter out of 25 chapters in, in the book. Uh, but it's got some really critical information that nobody's ever looked at before. And if you're interested, there's two ways you can look at the survey. We've got them for sale for just basically the cost of printing back there. Or you can download them for free online. Just go to ipcpress.com, download the report for free, and uh, you can see what 14,000 secularists told us. So I do want to say thanks to the, uh, to the uh, Humanists of Canada for inviting me here today. And it looks like we're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, this is a picture I got at the uh, re recent rally. That's a full-blown replica of what's underneath my, my gown there in front. So today the, our objectives are to uh, look at the recent research and then to look at implications. What's the implications for this research on your particular sexuality? How many of you masturbate? I do. Okay, looks like we only got a few liars in this particular group. All right. Well, just imagine. Can you imagine asking that question in a church, in a mosque? How about in a Baptist, in a, in a mass? It just isn't going to happen. You can't ask those kinds of questions in churches and mosques. Because most religions, almost all the major religions on the planet, frown, seriously frown, on masturbation. Here's what, uh, here's what Mark Driscoll, a megachurch minister out, I believe it's Seattle at Mars Hill, said about masturbation. And ladies... Pay close attention to what he says. Um, Masturbation can be a form of homosexuality because it is a sexual act that does not involve a woman. If a man were to masturbate while engaged in other forms of sexual intimacy with his wife, then he would not be doing so in a homosexual way. Notice gals, you're getting off scot-free here. However, any man who does so without his wife in the room is bordering on homosexual, homosexual activity, particularly if he's watching himself in the mirror and being turned on by his own male body. What the fuck? Where did that guy get that? I never even thought about that until I read him. Isn't that amazing? So, how many of you have had premarital sex and believe it's fine? Okay, good, about the same number. So imagine asking that question in a Catholic church or a Baptist or a mosque. No, because premarital sex is absolutely forbidden in all of those religions. Does your God watch you while you're having sex? If you're a Christian, you're having a threesome with Jesus every time you have sex. I once had a Catholic uh, girlfriend. We only dated for about four months. I would go over to her house occasionally, but mostly we were at her, my place. One day I show up at her apartment and, and, all the, and I noticed there's all these Catholic, there's a crucifix, a Mary, you know, all sorts of things around her bedroom that are religious iconography. And I'm thinking, wow, where'd you get all this stuff? It wasn't here last time I was here. I said, yeah, you know, I just have to take it down. I, I can't come with Jesus watching me. <laughs> so religionists live a lie. And that's a pretty, pretty easy to prove. They pretend like they don't masturbate. I studied with the great psychotherapist Albert Ellis back in the 70s and 80s. Albert Ellis had a famous saying. He said 97% of all men admit to masturbating and 3% are lying. It's probably about 80% of women masturbate and 10% are lying because we do know some women tend to not masturbate at all. But women do masturbate quite at a pretty high frequency. We found in our own research a pretty high frequency of masturbation. Uh, religions claim they don't have premarital sex. They pretend like they don't use pornography, and they condemn others for what they do themselves. They're very good at condemning everybody else, and yet doing it themselves. Well, atheists don't seem to have this problem. Whether you're secular, atheist, humanist, agnostic, I don't care. We don't have the kind of problems that religionists generally have. And what Amanda Brown and I wanted to do was try and figure out how that functioned, how that worked in, in the lives of secularists. So we... we uh, concocted a, a, a questionnaire. We started off with over 100 questions and we refined it and we tested it off of several hundred people before we put it up for, for, um, uh, for final research online. And it turned out to have 69 questions in it. Now, Amanda, Amanda called me up the night before we put it online and said, Daryl, do you realize we have 69 questions in this report? I mean, in this survey? I said, nope, but it sounds about right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, my, my girlfriend looked at the schedule here, and she said, Wow, you're starting the whole fucking conference. 
yeah, that about sums it up. <laughs> so what, what we, Amanda and I, Amanda's an undergraduate at, uh, at uh, KU, and we had some, some real good skills that I, I needed some help on, especially online skills. So what we want to do is test the guilt cycle. I talk about the guilt cycle in, in, uh, in uh, The God Virus. How many of you read The God Virus? Oh, good. Good. Several people read The God Virus. All right. Well, I talk about the guilt cycle in The God Virus, but what I have never seen is any empirical testing of that hypothesis. I'd seen it in my clinical practice, and every psychologist I've ever, I've ever talked to seemed to see it in their practice as well, but nobody put any numbers to it, so we were going to do that. We put these, we put these questions together, and, uh, and then uh, we put them up online, and then we ask a number of the popular bloggers to help us. We ask Greta, who's sitting right up here. We ask PZ Myers, Jen McCright, um, you know, a whole list of bloggers, and they were all very helpful, very cooperative. They put it up and said, go out there. Uh, PZ Myers even put his up and said, you know, some pervert wants to know about your sex life. And he said, and PZ said, I took the survey and I found out I've got a very boring sex life. <laughs> So our response was, uh, we got 14,560 people who at least started the survey. Most, uh, all 65% or right at 65% completed it, right at 10,000 people, filled out every single question. It took about 45 minutes, at minimum, 45 minutes to complete this survey. Now, if you've done any online surveys, you know after about the third question, you're finished. We got 65% completion rate. Most researchers are delighted to get a 60% completion rate. And many researchers will, be, will settle for a 50% completion rate. So we were absolutely delighted with this. And even, uh, even the people who didn't finish the survey oftentimes didn't finish it because they got knocked offline or you know, some other thing happened. So we've got a lot of evidence that even the people who didn't finish it might have if there hadn't been technical problems or whatever for them. Well, when we were finished, it took us about five months to, to analyze the data because that's a heck of a lot of data. And for every question on a 1 to 10 scale or 1 to 5 scale, we let people put comments in. We got 4,000 pages of comments. <laughs> people told us their life story. And I'll show you just a few comments later. But it was amazing what people told us. I, I, to this day, we haven't been able to finish reading all of these pages of comments. Uh, but so once we'd finished it, I, uh, I contacted Greta over here. And I said, Greta, would you mind looking at it? And she said, no, nope, I'd look at it. She not only looked at it, but she wrote an incredibly good article for it and put it up on Alternet. Well, then it went viral. This sucker went everywhere. And I, it, it screwed up two months of my life. <laughs> I was getting calls from Russia. I was getting emails from Chile. Uh, the Daily Mail picked it up. Uh, the New York Post picked it up. The New York Los Angeles Times picked it up. We had just, you just Google sex and secularism and there's thousands of hits on it. It also became a good kind of study in anthropology and, and memetics because we could tell which reporters were reading which reporters. They didn't, re they didn't bother to read our survey. So they were, they were if, if it was a fairly accurate report, they probably got it from Greta's, Greta's article. But there were two other people who wrote reports that said almost the exact opposite in some places of what we said. And then other reporters, of course, would report their, what they reported. So it, it got perpet, per, perpetuated. We even made Playboy magazine. My friend, I got back, I, I was on vacation in Europe last year. I got back, uh, I had an email. Did, he said, do you realize you're in Playboy magazine? I said, no, do I have my clothes on? <laughs> he said, yeah, you got your clothes on. So I, you know, I got the, uh, my, my, my girlfriend went, she had to go to three different stores to find Playboy, and when she find it, finally found it, the clerk said, you know, we don't usually get women buying this magazine here. <laughs> said it's the first time she'd ever bought a Playboy herself. So uh, she brings it home, and what do you know? It's got a little, little three-inch art article in the uh, Playboy. Now, I'm bigger than three inches. I want you to know that. So, but anyway, we had, we had three inches in Playboy, just a little column. Uh, didn't even happen to mention my name. It just said Dateline Bonner Springs, Kansas. Now, how many sex researchers do you think there are in Bonner Springs, Kansas? I'm hoping they, I hope they were talking about me. Six hypotheses is what we looked at. Uh, and we will not go into all these today. We're only going to look at a few of them. But here's the main things we're looking at. Religion's use of sexual guilt is measurably greater in conservative religions and less in liber liberal ones. People feel the sexual guilt taught by their religion, but sexual behavior shows no difference from those with less guilt. <coughs> Religiously conservative parents are less effective at teaching their children about sex than the more secular parents. Children raised in highly religious homes receive poorer sexual education. Number five, 
Le leaving a religion has a positive impact on sexual satisfaction. And number six, religion is continuing negative consequences on individuals after they leave. So we, were, we, we gathered a tremendous amount of information, a lot of which had nothing to do with sexuality. Like we asked, what religion were you born in? And how, you know, how long were you in that religion? And, and uh, how guilty were you? And how much guilt was taught to you during that time that you were in the religion? Uh, when did you leave, leave religion? That sort of stuff. So we could put up a, um, a, a, a graph here, and I'll throw that up there right now. A graph that shows, you know, I know you can't see that very well from way back there, so I'll just have to kind of tell you what it says. This is uh, what religion were you before you became non-religious. And we, were, we wanted to test this against the population. And what we found was about 19%, 90.7% of our sample were former Catholics. Well, that's pretty close to where Catholics are in the general population. Catholics are around 20 to 22% of the general population. We also found that uh, a Christian non-denominational 14.4% of our sample was called themselves Christian non-denominational. Now here's the real interesting thing about this particular statistic. Christian non-denominational is only 8% of the general population. So that means Christian non-denominational is a gateway drug. It's a gateway religion into atheism. What we found, and we, we, we did a lot of in-depth research from the comments that people made, and we found that people are searching, and we'll see them going step by step from one religion to the next religion. When they get to Christian non-denominational, that is such a crazy religion, there's nowhere else to go. So what do they do? They jump off the cliff into, into secularism. That, that that's, appears to be what's going on. So uh, we, we can see that 14% uh, of our population were lifelong atheists. Now by that means, we ask, uh, they had to be atheists since about age 14 and on before we'd consider them lifelong atheists. So, you know, a pretty good sample of our uh, group was, were like, well, lifelong atheists. So, uh, Catholics, Christian non-denominational, Baptists, if you combine all the Baptists together, 6.6%. 6 .6%. So, there's uh, three of the largest groups. Uh, here's the overall breakdown. 80% of our sample consider themselves atheists at this time. All we said was you can, you can only take this survey if you claim to be an agnostic, an atheist, a humanist, a secularist, you cannot be religious. We don't want, we don't religious, I'm not interested in Catholic sexuality. We're only interested in, in non-religious sexuality. So you can see 80% atheist. We also had, uh, we couldn't control who took it. 20% of our sample were international. And uh, we, we would have loved to have broken down some of this data by, by, uh, by nations, but we didn't get a big enough sample. Uh, but you can see here that 5.1% uh, were from Canada, 739 of our uh, people who filled it out. And the uh, UK was right behind them with 4.7%. Uh, we, we were a bit concerned because we wanted to kind of understand what's the difference between U.S.-based uh, people and non-U.S.-based people. And we were concerned that maybe that would uh, skew our data in some way. And what we found out was, yeah, people living outside the United States are not nearly as hung up about sex as the ones inside the United States. <laughs> So, so, so you guys, you guys helped make it look better than it really is. If we subtract out the internationals from our data, it gets a lot worse. So, and I, and what you're seeing here includes everybody. 100% of our sample goes into these. So imagine if, if some of the guilt stuff I'm going to show you, it would probably be several points higher if we subtracted out you Canadian, just the Canadians alone. Would, would help make it look a lot worse on the United States. Because you guys are pretty, uh, pretty sexually open, it seems to us. So we're going to test the guilt cycle. I first explored in, in the God virus. And, uh, and I'm taking this data and I'm putting it into the, the new book, Sex and God, to show how the guilt cycle actually works. And here's a simple summary of the guilt cycle. <coughs> your mom says, don't, uh, don't eat cookies before supper. It'll spoil your supper. So one day, you're pretty hungry, cookies taste great, you put your hand in the cookie jar, you eat a cookie, mom catches you, slaps your hand, says, don't do that again. So we've got uh, tension, B tension, I'm, I'm hungry, I want, I want some, a cookie to eat, uh, behavior, I eat the cookie, now mom slaps my hand, so I've learned the rule. Tomorrow, tomorrow I'm still hungry, mom's not looking, I reach in the cookie jar, I get the cookie, I eat it, I never get caught. But there's a little twinge, and that twinge we call guilt. It's actually in psychological terms called cognitive dissonance. Here's the rule. Here's my behavior. The dissonance is, in, is expressed in, in the form we call guilt, and in, in just most of us call guilt. So 
we're, we're expressing it as guilt, and we got to do something, you know, to get rid of the guilt. Maybe we, we cry. Maybe we go back to talk, talk to our mom. We say, oh, I'll never do that again. Of course, tomorrow we'll do it again. So, in, but religion comes along and says, you know, we can teach you what to be guilty of. Your mom taught you to be guilty about eating cookies before supper. But whether you did it, continue to do it or not, you still probably felt a little twinge of guilt. Religion comes along and says, you know, we can teach you what to be guilty of. You should be guilty of having premarital sex. You should be guilty about lusting after, uh, lusting after someone else. You should be guilty about masturbating. So we teach you all these things to be guilty of. And what religion then says is once you, f you feel the tension, you engage in the behavior, you masturbate or have premarital sex, then you feel the guilt. Well, what are you going to do with that guilt? The only thing you can do is go back to your religion and get forgiveness. So, if you're a Catholic, you go back to the priest, you can do confession. If you're a Baptist, you read your Bible, you pray, you ask for forgiveness. If you're a Islam, a Muslim, you pray and ask God for forgiveness. The only place you can get forgiveness is the place you learn the guilt in the first place. Have you ever heard of a Catholic confessing their sins to a Muslim imam? Have you ever heard of a Muslim confessing their sins to a Baptist? It doesn't work that way, does it? You only get forgiveness for your sins... You only get relief from your guilt by going back to the religion you learned it at. That's the guilt cycle. It is a perfect, it's, it's a wonderful con game. It keeps you infected with a particular God virus. Keeps you infected with Mormonism if you're a Mormon. Keeps you infected with baptism if you're a Baptist. Name the religion, it keeps you infected. Because guilt brings you back to that particular religion. I think it's, it's just a beautiful system uh, in psychological terms. It's very insidious otherwise. So I'm going to read you a little quote from Butch Hancock, who is a songwriter out of uh, Texas. And he can teach us a little bit about the guilt cycle here. He says, Life in Lubbock, Texas taught me two things. One, that God loves you and you're going to burn in hell. The other is that sex is the most awful dirty thing on the face of the earth. And you should save it for someone you love. Does that sound about right for some of you? Yeah. Yeah, my worst relatives are all from Texas. I know, I know a lot of Butch Hancocks, actually, in my family. So here's one of the things we're looking at. Is there a difference in how, uh, is there a difference in how different religions use guilt? So this is hypothesis number one. How would you rate what you were taught, how guilty you felt about sex and its implications on yourself, on a scale of one to ten? Now this, to me, is, in our, all of our research, this is probably among the most interesting of all the graphs that we have in the report. And this is guilt by denomination. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to go back here. I want to ask, and I have a, a prize for anybody that gets the right answer. And if we have a tie, we'll have to figure out how to get rid of that tie. Uh, I, want, I want to, nominations. What's the most guilt-ridden, sexually guilt-ridden religion? Now, of the major ones that you would encounter in North America. Catholic? Catholic? Uh, Muslim? I'm going to say not Muslim because we didn't get a big enough sample there. So don't worry. I'm not disqualified. If you want to take a second guess, you can. So I've got Catholic. Do I hear anything else? Mormon. Who said? Who said? Mormons? Anybody other guesses? Who? Baptists. All right. All right. We have a winner. The Mormon. Mormons are the most guilty, sexual guilty religion in the United States. Catholics are clear down here. Now, this is guilt by denomination. And, by the way, come and collect. I have a, it's a peanut vibrator. I'm not sure you can use it, but you're... <laughs> what do I do with it? Are you using it? Oh, it's clean. Uh, yeah, it's, it's clean. <laughs> here, here you go. Yeah. And, and I will sign it for you afterwards. Thank right. you. <laughs> All right. Usually I kind of like the gals to win it, but, you know, maybe he's got a gal that will benefit. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Mormons are the most guilty. But if you look at this graph, you'll see that we have uh, right behind them are Jehovah's Witnesses and not very far behind them. It's even within statistical uh, sampling error. Pentecostal, Seventh-day Adventists. Those four are clearly right there. Their four are clearly above everybody else. Fascinating, I think. Now, Baptists are number five. So whoever said Baptist, you weren't too far off. But a lot of people guess Catholic. And I think what happened was we got a lot of cafeteria Catholics in our sample, probably. Of course, I can't prove that. I don't have any way of knowing it. They just said they were formerly Catholic. But it is, a, I think, it, Catholics do have a lot of guilt, but there's others that are a lot worse. And I think you can see of those top four, 
pretty cult-like. That, cult, that cult-like behavior really uses a lot of guilt in, uh, in ways that are pretty insidious. So we can see that the fastest growing and strongest cultish, most cultish religions uh, use a lot of guilt. Uh, I found this, I thought this is just delightful. <laughs> Thank the Heavenly Father for closeted southern hypocrites. This is the top 10 states searching for gay sex on Google over the last 12 months. Where is, where is the highest use of pornography in the United States? Utah. And number two? Mississippi. Mississippi's number two. And those just happen to be two of the most religious states in the United States. So does religious guilt prevent or stop sexual behavior? Of course, the theory is, and it's just a theory, of course, that religion actually changes people's behavior. I want, I want empirical proof. Does Catholicism, does being a Baptist, does being a Mormon actually change your behavior? So this is a fairly complicated graph. I'll walk it through it with you, but you don't need to worry about uh, all the details. You can look at it uh, yourself later. Uh, what we found was uh, we, we measured four different things. We said, uh, when did you first start um, masturbating? When did you first start petting? When did you start oral sex? And when did you start uh, intercourse? And this is by, uh, we're going to split the group here. We're going to do a little experiment. We're going to split the group. We're going to take anybody who said uh, that they're, they were taught they had religious guilt on a 1, 2, or 3, or an 8, 9, or a 10. And we're going to cut the middle out. We're just going to ignore the middle and just look at the extremes, which is still about 5,000 people. So it's a pretty big part of our sample. And we're going to look at those folks and ask them, you know, the difference. So when did you start? Because it would, if religion really does make a difference, then we should see clear differences between the most secular on the low end, one, two, three, and the least secular, the most religious on the high end. Would you agree? If Catholicism stops you from masturbating, then the people who got the most Catholicism as they're growing up should masturbate less. Same for Mormons or Baptists. Well, that's what we're really looking at here. So religious at age 15 and non-religious at age 15. That's what we've got here. And we can see that the most religious kids, the ones that were given 8, eight 9, or a 10 in religiosity at age 15, at, as they were growing up, said they started masturbating 83% by the time they were 15 years old. The non-religious kids were masturbating 3.7% more. 8, 867 In other words, all that religious guilt is worth 3.7%. All, all that training about... Uh, Mormons. Mormons get this pamphlet that says don't, that is titled Don't Tamper with the Factory. And it's, it's four pages that never uses the word sex, never uses the word masturbation, never uses the word penis. Of course, it's just for boys, not for girls. So, can, how do you write four pages about masturbation and never use the word masturbation? But they do. And this is written by, I believe, William Packer back in 1963. Every more, any extra Mormons in here? No ex-Mormons? Okay. Well, if, you, if uh, every one of them I've ever talked to, if they were still Mormon at 12, got the pamphlet. It's, it's a ritual. Mitt Romney was one of those elders that was required to do the sex ed for boys. He was handing boys, 12-year-old boys, this pamphlet. Mitt Romney saying, don't tamper with the factory. Don't masturbate. So we can see there's no difference. Now, what a, uh, now let's move on up to a higher age group. Is there any difference in masturbation for the 18-year-olds? Well, nope, 90 and 92.8 percent. Well, how about some other things like oral sex and petting? Well, see, we can see 81 versus 84 percent of the religious versus non-religious are petting. Well, how about oral sex? That's some sucking somebody's pussy or cock. And look at this, 55 versus 62. Okay, there's a 7 percent difference between these two groups at this point in time. So maybe we're seeing a little bit of impact, 7% guilt. And uh, how about intercourse? Well, it's well, 53 versus 62. Here we have a 9% difference in having actual sexual intercourse, getting in the backseat of the car and doing it. That's what's going on here. So there's a 9% a difference between the most and least religious at 18. But look what happens. By the age of 21, they're pretty much caught back up. They're screwing somebody, no matter how religious, no matter what their religious training was. Now, I'm, set, I'm showing you what we found out of 14,560 people. Our data shows no difference from the national abstinence-only research. 
the Gutmaker Institute, the ARIS surveys. Um, there's two others I'm drawing a blank on. Every major national survey shows the same thing ours does. So one of the big criticisms, and Greta was great. Greta wrote a great article, and she pointed out the criticisms and the weaknesses in the research. There's no such thing as perfect research, by the way. But uh, one of the weaknesses is, yeah, this isn't a random sample. Well, there's no such thing as a random sample when you're talking about sex. Can you imagine the Gallup Institute picking up the phone and calling a Baptist and asking, when did you start masturbating? I don't think that's going to happen. When did, did you have premarital sex? Probably not. Click. So you would have a non-participation rate was pretty high, and you wouldn't get your 65% re, uh, response rate. So we can see that at not, the non-religious, just look at the two, these two graphs right here. This is the, the most religious group and the least religious group on all four of these. There's hardly any difference. So I don't care how much religion you were raised with, there's no evidence that religion is making a smidgen's worth of difference. Abstinence-only training shows that if you take and, and wear a promise ring, you go to this you know, kind of perverted dance with your father and put a promise ring on, you won't fuck anybody for about three or four months at longer. It'll, it'll, ho it'll hold you off for about three or four months, and then you'll be in having sex. Now, the problem is you'll be having sex without a condom because you were told in the promise ring ceremony the condoms don't work. Interesting. So let's move on and say, where did you get your sexual information? Uh, so we're asking, where, what kind of places did you get sexual information from? And we're first of all going to look at the least religious. This, these, are, these are kids of secularists or atheists or agnostics. And we can see here that uh, peer groups, 75% said, I got my sex education from peer groups. How many of you were here last night to hear Dr. DiCarlo talk? Yeah, you know, he said the same thing. He said he got his sex education from his older brother. Well, I was the older brother in our family, so I had to go out and find out for myself and then turn around and teach my brothers. Actually, my brothers taught me. I was the goody two-shoes in the family. Uh, so, so peers. Next was um, experience. 42% uh, of our sample said they get in the back seat of a car and they actually do something, probably. Or they get a motel room or they go to their boyfriend or girlfriend's uh, bedroom or dorm room or something, but they're they're actually engaging in sexual activity. That's where they're getting their experience uh, and knowledge. And uh, 20, 38% uh, said they got it from their parents. Now think about that. 38% of our sample said they got their sex ed from parents. That's pretty lousy. I mean, that means what 68, 62% is getting it from somewhere else. Parents aren't talking to their kids. And these are secular parents. And next is, is pornography and, and the Internet. So 27, 20 some percent for both of those. So these are the least religious kids. Now look, let's look at the most religious kids. The ones that raised said their, their religiosity at home and guilt, guilt at home was 8, 9, or a 10. Oh, I'm sorry. So the key things are experience. Parents and pornography. So pornography, getting my knowledge from pornography for the least, uh, least uh, religious kids. Now the most religious kids, 70% said they got their information from peers. 50.2% said they got their education from, from the, um, I'm sorry, from experience. Getting in the back seat and doing something. Notice the difference? That's even higher than these secular kids. They're getting in the backseat and doing something 8% more than the non than the non-religious kids are. And uh, where else? How about uh, pornography? 33% said pornography, which is about the same amount as our, our uh, which is actually four or five percent higher than the secular kids. But look at parents. So experience, porn, and parents. Same three. Parents were 13%. In other words, religious kids are even worse getting information from their parents than the secular kids are. Now, as I said earlier, we got 4,000 pages of comments. So after every question, we allowed people to put some text in. So we went straight to those kids and said, who, who said they got their education from their parents and, and they were very religious. We looked at what they told us. And what they said was, yeah, my parents sat me down and talked to me about, about sex, education, sex education. And what they tell you? They told them. Condoms don't work. Tom, you can't have birth control. 
You can't date until you're 18 or 21 or whatever. That's the kind of sex education they were getting. Isn't that amazing? So even when kids are getting sex education from their parents, it's bad information. It's certainly not science-based. The University of Georgia had an enormous mega meta study that stated that found that states with the strongest policy and budget emphasis on abstinence-only education also have the highest sexually transmitted infections and teen pregnancies. This is true even after controlling for socioeconomic status, education, and other variables. Wow. So in other words, if you teach kids to just say no, they're probably going to say yes, and, but they're going to do it without any protection. So that, now let's look on and look at us, you and I. Now that you're non-religious, how has your sex life changed? A one means it's got worse. A ten means it got a lot better. Here's a, here's a picture that one of our respondents set in. And if you'll see there, she has a big smile on her face there. I asked her permission to use this photo, and she said, certainly. So how has your sex life changed? On a one to ten scale. 54.6% of our sample said their sex life improved an 8, 9, or a 10. It really improved a lot. Now, a 5, is, it didn't change at all. That, so that's where we got that, that middle 27% or so said it didn't change at all. But clear down here at the bottom, 2.2% said it got worse. We were real curious about what was getting worse in their sex life. So we, again, we looked at the comments, and the comments said things like, I told my wife I'm an atheist, and she said, well, I can't sleep with you anymore. I can't share the bed with somebody that doesn't share my faith. But even more funny, we had a 24-year-old kid said, well, I became an atheist recently, and I used to be able to bed every girl in the Sunday school class, and now they won't speak to me anymore. <laughs> so good Christian girls, they'll screw you if you're, an, if you're a Christian, but not if you're an atheist. So... It was really, sometimes the, uh, the comments were so much more informative. So, religion. How much has your uh, sex life improved based upon the denomination you were raised in? There's no surprises here. We can see that if you're a Jehovah's Witnesses, you're having, if, and you're no longer. If you're an atheist, ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, you're practically having an orgy every night. And especially if you're a Mormon, Seventh-day Adventist, or Pentecostal. Remember, those were the four that were so high in guilt to begin with. Now, this is just another way to measure the guilt cycle. If the guilt cycle is working, we would tend to see these kinds of results as a result of leaving a, a particular religion. So what's normal for us as secularists? We wanted to know how we're behaving. And so we asked a number of questions. We're going to start here with women. What's your sexual entertainment? How do you get sexual entertainment? Besides actually engaging in sex, of course. And what we found was uh, women like erotic novels, right here, 49.5% of the time. Women like DVDs, 43.4%, but they have to have a plot. 43.4%, they like porn with a plot, so to speak. And then uh, women like pictures, you know, penthouse or Playboy or whatever, 40% of the time. And the internet, 36.5% 30, 30, uh, of the time. Now, 24% of our, of our sample said, I do not like porn. So we've got a, you know, about a quarter of the women in our sample just don't even you know, enjoy that particular thing. Now, I want you to remember the sequence here. So we've got erotic novels, we've got uh, films with a plot, then we've got pictures, and then we've got um, um, inter internet. The internet's 36.5. Let's look at men. Where do men get their sexual entertainment? If you just reverse it, you get the same thing. In other words, men like uh, internet shorts. I, oh, I'm sorry. Women, women I, I should have pointed that out. Internet shorts is uh, right here. Internet shorts is that, you know, 5, 10, 20 minutes, get off and get back to work kind of a thing. So that was a joke, guys. All right. <laughs> You're not paying attention here. So, so men, men, are, uh, men like internet shorts, number one. That was number four for women. Uh, men like pictures. They like DVDs with a plot. Number three, men don't read. Internet novels or uh, no novels. They don't. Men don't like novels. Erotic novels. That was number one for women. It's number four for men. So you just take what men like and what women like and reverse it. But what we did find was about seventy plus percent of both groups are using porn in some way, shape, or form. Uh, we also found well, a lot of other interesting things I don't have time to talk about here today. We found that 29% of our sample was kinky. And boy, I learned new words. I, had, I thought I knew a lot about the world of sex, but there's some words I'd never heard of before. So, 
Is there a difference in the beginning of porn use by religiosity? Remember, most religions say porn is terrible. You're going to go to hell. Lusting after another person. Looking at a na nude picture of another person is, is sinful. So we want to know, is there any difference in when you started using porn? So here's, here's you, all you have to do is just glance at that. And you can see red, red is the uh, least, uh, most religious, and blue is the least religious. And you can see there are some differences, but those differences aren't that big. And by age about 16 or 18, there's no difference whatsoever. The only difference we found was that women start porn about two to three years later. And women peak out in their porn use at about 30 years of age. Men peak out in their porn use about 19 or 20 years, and they, you know, they don't go any higher, but they're already about 96% at that point in time. You don't get much higher at that point in time. Very few men told us they don't like porn, whereas 24% of women, women told us they, they like porn. So it does, what this shows us, it doesn't matter how religious you were raised, you started using porn about the same time, and you use it about the same amount. And the only difference we found was a difference between men and women. Uh, other research shows everything I've told you here today, we, almost everything I've told you here today, can be found in some other form uh, in other, other research, like the ARIS survey, the absence-only research by the U.S. government that spends billions of dollars finding out that absence-only doesn't work, and then we turn around and throw another billion dollars at it. That's a Barna, the Barna research. Barna, George Barna's out of California, fundamentalist, evangelical, social science researcher. He can find no difference in sexual behavior either. So uh, I like George Barna, but only because uh, he's, he's an honest Christian. He's one of the few I've ever found in, in this kind of research. Here's what some respondents said to, said to us. After, after, I'm not afraid to have sex now. I don't feel guilty about masturbating, and I don't feel bad anymore about having sucked my friend's cock. On a side note, I'd like to mention he was the preacher's son at the church I was attending. <laughs> or here's one that really illustrates the, uh, the research from uh, the absence only in the United States, absence only research. There was a large space of time between becoming sexually active and becoming non-religious. During that time, I put myself at a necessary risk of disease and pregnancy. While I was religious, guilt kept me from taking basic precautions like birth control or condom use. To me, using any sort of contraceptive was tantamount to admitting that I was planning for and indeed desirous of sexual activities. Deciding to not use contraception allowed me to convince myself that my pleasure was a side effect of fulfilling my boy's, boyfriend's desire for sexual activity. We see this over and over again in our, in our report, that sexual activity, uh, you go ahead and do it, but you justify it in different ways, or you justify it in, in some way that, um, like this woman does. So within our sample, there's the following evidence. If you leave religion, your sexual, uh, your sexual satisfaction tends to go up per, per significantly. We also found that the best thing you can do for your sex life is don't marry a religious person. We found an inverse relationship between your spouse's religi religiosity and your sexual satisfaction. We, we asked people, how religious is your spouse? You're an atheist, but how about your spouse? If you rated your spouse an 8, 9, or a 10, your sexual satisfaction was a one, two, or three, 70 percent of the time. So highly religious spouses really don't, I mean, you're not going to have a very good sex life if you're married to a highly religious spouse. It's another test of the guilt cycle. People feel guilty about sexual activity uh, in, that, in that situation. So sexual guilt, we also found that evidence that sexual guilt does not change behavior. There's very little bit of evidence that in any of the research, including ours, that sexual guilt is, um, in, in, has any effect on it. Let me give you a quote to think about. You can take religion out of sex, but you can't take sex out of religion. Imagine the Pope waking up one day and saying, Whoa, I had the best wet dream last night. I think we'll make masturbation legal. I don't think we're going to see that. How about Ted Haggard saying, Man, I really had enjoyed having sex with that male prostitute in Denver. Maybe, maybe we should make homosexual legal in the evangelical world. No, because religions need sex to propagate themselves. Religion is a sexually transmitted disease, as I talk about in the God virus and, and fully in Sex and God. You might say, well, I'm not religious. How does this all affect me? Well, you're swimming in a very polluted religious culture. Many atheists, in my estimation, are still infected with religious ideas. Sometimes I am appalled appalled at what atheists believe about sex and sexuality when I realize they are still infected with religious ideas 
around, around themselves, their bodies, other people's bodies. If you experience guilt or shame around your sexuality, you are still infected with religious ideas. We act like Christians when we hide our sexuality, when we pretend we don't or didn't do something sexual like premarital sex or masturbate. We, we act like Christians when we let when, and condemn other people for perfectly legal sexual activity. Or when we act ashamed of our sexuality, such as this. Religions want to make you feel ashamed of who you are. These are all over Kansas, where I come from. You know, Kansas is the uh, ground zero fundamentalism in the United States. So you might, I'm gonna, you remember Jeff Foxworthy, you might be a redneck if? Well, I'm going to tell you, you might be a Christian atheist. Think about that, a Christian atheist, if you feel guilty about masturbating. You might be a Christian atheist if you feel shame at admitting you enjoy pornography. You might be a Christian atheist if you have difficulty talking to your children about sex or sexuality. You might be a Christian atheist if you have difficulty talking to your spouse or partner about sexual fantasies you would like to try. And I see this a lot among atheists. I couldn't tell my wife, I can't tell my husband that I would like them to tie me up or I'd like them to spank me because they, they think I was weird. Well, you know, that's a religious idea. It has nothing to do with human sexuality. You might be a Christian atheist if you feel disgust around normal sexual activities. So religion, the weak spot of religion is sex and sexuality. Uh, I think we need to fight this and we need to be out about our sexuality. I love the gay community because they are so open about their sexuality. Why aren't we open about it? Why are we acting like Christians? That's really the focus of, of, of my book, Sex and God, is let's get out of this programming that we've been given by our secular, uh, by our religious culture. And yes, Canadians are also in a polluted stream. You still got a lot of religion going on around you. You don't even see it sometimes. So be out about your sexuality and respect and support others in their sexual preferences. Uh, for example, you could say, yeah, sure, I fornicate, just like most religious people do. Or sure, I masturbate. Don't you? You know, if, if religious people, they're trying to make you feel guilty about something that's perfectly normal, let's just go back at them. Sure, I enjoy por pornography, just like most religious people. Frame their behavior. Control of women's bodies is what most religions are all about. And we need to challenge that thinking. Here's what a woman might say to somebody. She might say, I take birth control because I like sex, inside or outside of marriage, just like Rush, Rush Limbaugh and Newt Gingrich do. That frames it, doesn't it? I mean, those guys are out there screwing everything they can, and they're condemning us for our sexual behavior. They're, I, don't, I have never had five wives, but these guys, you know, they're, they're hitting on that, both of them. So 95% of all Americans, and probably more than that in Canada, have premarital sex. The 5% that don't are all Baptist ministers, Catholic priests, and nuns. So I think we could ask questions like, do you think your minister um, used condoms with his two girlfriends in Bible college? Do you think your priest masturbates or uses porn? I think these are legitimate questions to ask. Yeah, they'll get pissed off and offended, but what's wrong with asking that question? They are condemning us for that behavior. I want to see if they're following their own guidelines. And what we find out is they don't. They use porn more than we do in many cases. So here's some secular advice for all of us. There are 7 billion people on this planet going to 9 billion. We don't need any more people. Reproduction in fact, is not the goal of sex. The talk last night, I really wanted to raise my hand and challenge a couple things he said. Reproduction is not the goal of sex in the human species. We re reproduce quite well. Reproduction has other functions like bonding and, you know, and, and creating um, community. So we should, we should be looking at sex as a positive human value and something we can do responsibly. So sex is fun, so is drinking. So let's do them responsibly, and uh, let's, as rationalists, let's create our own sexual value system around who we are and what we are, and, uh, and not let the religionists frame our sexuality for us. Let's be out about our sexuality. Let's be in, in your face. I'm not going to let anybody tell me I can't choose my sexual preferences, and I'm not going to let any religionists tell me I'm wrong for doing it. I'm going to challenge them because I'm going to challenge them in their lie. You say you don't masturbate, I don't believe that. You say you don't use porn, I don't believe that. You say your minister's never had sex before he got married, I don't believe that. Prove, you, it, the burden of proof is on you because the statistics show 95% of the people or more are doing the things you say you shouldn't be doing. 
All right. Well, I hope you'll take a look at Sex and God. I hope you'll take a look at the at the um, survey. Just go to ipcpress.com. You can download it for free or you can get a, a printed copy out there. And thanks a lot for your attention here. I'll take any questions if there's any time. There's no time left. So I'm, I'm screwed.